Denise Murphy uh, is here today, and we're so excited that she's with us. Denise is the Chief Safety and Quality Officer at Mainline Health in Philadelphia, a hospital system out there. She understands um, the work that integrated systems have to do. It's not one hospital, but in her case, they have five throughout the Philadelphia area. But she really established herself and her credibility through, uh, you can read in the packet, her um, wonderful background and, and experience in epidemiology and infection prevention and then is uh, Chief Safety and Quality Officer at Barnes Jewish in St. Louis. Um, she took their organization with others in the leadership um, uh, on a high reliability journey. They started a number of years ago and have seen some great results that she's going to share with us. Um, but as you'll see through her presentation discussion, she's going to share some of the tools, some of the things that they learned along the way. Um, so hopefully we could take that in and understand and uh, not have some hiccups or bumps along the road, but learn from others and uh, gain their insights. So Denise, thank you so much for coming down from Philly to join us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Good morning, everyone. So first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mayer and Lynn for bringing me to uh, MedStar and allowing me to share our journey uh, with all of you because it is, um, I think as a nurse, uh, I wake up every day and feel like I'm in the best job in the world to be doing patient safety and keeping patients safe. Um, my own mother died of a hospital acquired infection when I was in my 22nd year as an infection preventionist. So. Um, it's a, a feeling of powerlessness, uh, anger, uh, frustration when you look at the wonderful things that we offer uh, in our country for health care. Uh, so it's my passion, as it is uh, Dave's and so many others in the room, so it's really an honor to share our journey. So I won't go through um, objectives. There's a lot of things I won't go through in this um, presentation because it's in your handout. Because in talking to Dave last night, understanding how uh, one of the competencies of this health system is incredible videography, I thought that it would make more sense rather than looking at certain slides to plug in a couple of the, uh, we do a lot of our training in an interactive way. A lot of our physician leaders have volunteered to be our movie stars. And so I've decided to plug in a couple of videos instead of uh, just, you know, death by PowerPoint. So, uh, but I think I'll start with the, what's the most important thing that um, we should be thinking of when we think about patient safety is what people expect from us. And their expectations are really very important. They expect that we won't hurt them, that we will help them, and we will be nice to them. So we refer to that as patient safety, quality, and patient satisfaction our patient advocacy. So I think it's, um, it's important that we always remain focused on the patient. I find that in selling this or making the case for this, there is no money that has to be discussed. There is no business aspect of this that's more important than the patient being the center of, uh, of why we're doing what we do every day. And that's really what brings the clinicians to the table. The second side of our work is understanding that the people who touch patients are, for someone like me who is no longer um, in an ICU or in an operating room, you know, my, my nursing care, really, if you will, is around the people who touch patients and understanding what they expect from us. They expect us as leaders to create a safe, high quality, and very reliable workplace. They expect that we're going to have a culture that they feel safe in, where they can uh, exercise safety behaviors without fear of punitive response. They expect that we're going to design processes so that it will be safe for them and it will be harder for them to make mistakes and easy to do the right thing every time. And they expect behavioral accountability. When you put those three things together, that's pretty much what we mean when we talk about reliability. They expect support when things go wrong. Um, many of you know of and uh, will certainly continue for many years, I'm sure, under uh, Dave's leadership on the Just Culture journey. And uh, this is where human error is not punished. Instead, it is investigated. We understand uh, that system errors are often behind uh, individual um, uh, inability to perform, and that they're found and that they're fixed. We're proactively um, uncomfortable about risk, and we're always looking for errors and how, uh, or risk, and how we can fix it. 
and that unsafe behaviors result in appropriate action. Not that we are out to penalize everyone for human error. We're also not there to ignore people who um, are trendsetters in terms of um, intentional uh, non-compliance with safety behaviors. So that's what uh, just culture means to me, and I think that's what employees really expect. So um, I don't need to go through all of the history of why patient safety is so important. And you have uh, your own stories. And we have people like Helen uh, as national leaders who are helping people understand that we still are not uh, the safe kind of health system that we need to be. And so many of our loved ones have been lost to um, medical errors. But Bob Wachter, who's one of the um, leaders, really, of, of the movement and in educating, I think, the physician world, um, uh, along, of course, with uh, Dr. Lucian Leap and others who have, you know, made this movement so important in our country, um, have asked the question, well, how have we done lately? So we started asking the question um, locally at Mainline Health, how have we done lately? And we agreed to a diagnostic assessment with HPI, Healthcare Performance Improvement, and we did our diagnostics in the fall of 2009. And you know, the health, uh, the uh, Hospital Association of Pennsylvania uh, received a grant from their foundation, which allowed the hospitals in Pennsylvania to choose to become part of this opportunity to do a deep dive, if you will. When I say diagnostic, I mean that a deep dive into what really were the individual failures and the system failures that resulted in harm or death to our patients at Mainline Health. And we looked at a three-year period over that three-year period, we were able to go back and retrospectively look at, and I understand that might not be the best way because of recall and other issues, but we still were able to uh, review in depth 73 safety events that occurred from January of 2006 through October of 2009. In addition to that deep dive with HPI sort of facilitating a very different way of doing cause analysis and a very different way of understanding individual and, and system errors. Uh, we also did interviews and had discussions with over 500 staff, physicians, and organizational leaders. We did focus groups and we actually talked to them and we asked them to describe in their own words, what's the uh, culture of safety like here? What do, you, what do you sense? What do you feel? What are the things that um, help shape the way people in this organization behave? So we had that as very important data. There was a review of our documents and, and um, policies, the tour of our facility, and some observations about how our healthcare teams interact. And then finally, they reviewed the data from uh, what was the first AHRQ uh, safety culture uh, survey that was done at Mainline Health, and then the Gallup employee surveys where they had a section on patient safety. So all of these data together were put into a package and presented back to um, our executive leadership first, our physician leadership, and then and all of the um, organization from managers up. When we talked about human error, we found uh, that this probably would look the same in most places. It was broken into what kind of errors are knowledge-based? Well, surprisingly, only 20%. So most people really knew what they needed to do in order to perform safely. Skill-based errors, those you know, sort of um, automatic pilot kinds of things like getting in the car and strapping your seatbelt on without even thinking. Um, very few, I mean 11% really isn't much. And not surprising, the rule-based errors, or what I fondly refer to as lack of compliance with our um, rules and our policies around safety, was the majority of the um, reasons for why patients were harmed in our organization. So although you might know this stuff, when it's put in writing and it's created in documents and graphics, it's pretty, everyone in the room was squirming and feeling like, could this really be our organization? Are we, is it really 70% of the time that non-compliance with safety rules results in harm? So that was the first thing that woke us up. And HPI continued to give us information uh, based on this deep dive as to what the common causes of harm were as evidenced by and with descriptions of individual failure modes and most likely caused by the system failures. So most individual failures were often backed up by 
um, weaknesses in the system. You know, we might have policies that are so hard that people really can't get to. What, what does this mean to my work if I'm uh, a frontline staff nurse? Communication being down here kind of flipped me out. I thought, how could communication be at the bottom? It's the, if you look at the Joint Commission's voluntary reporting database, you know, lack of communication and teamwork is, is really uh, the crux of what happens in 90% of the um, reported events of harm. But if you look at some of this communication, uh, variation in monitoring and oversight of novice practitioners, um, and assuring uh, that there is compliant action. Ineffective use of peer checking. That's all about communication, right? I mean, it's about empowerment. It's about a culture that supports people speaking up and actually giving them the tools to peer check. And then it takes a lot of courage, especially when you're looking at some of our new nurses are in their 20s. So peer checking, we talk about, you know, power distance, which I'll get more into in a minute, speaking up to people in authority. But sometimes it's harder to speak to the nurse that, you know, covers you when you go on break and maybe somebody that you've worked with for, for 15 years as a peer. So they break this all down for us. And um, then we looked at our AHRQ survey, and sadly, this is not only a statement about mainline health, but about the national data. So let me just grab a couple of things. So handoff and transitions, wow. We were statistically significantly better than the country at 45% of the time, our staff believe we did effective handoffs. How frightening is that when you look at our behavior, but you also look at it, here's the national average and then our regional average, uh, which is organizations like us in our uh, particular um, area. So non-punitive response to error, I kind of wish that we were using just culture. I think the whole non-punitive language is, and it's where we started in patient safety, which uh, with talking about non-punitive, but it certainly does confuse people because when you try to hold them accountable, they think you're being punitive. So when you use just culture language, it, it makes much more sense because they understand just and fair so that the person who's an intentional bad actor or won't comply with safety rules. They understand why there would be corrective action needed there. On the other side of that spectrum, people making human errors because we don't have good systems designed around them and we don't have a culture that's supporting uh, peer checking or stopping the line, then you know that kind of language makes sense. But nevertheless, this is in the AHRQ survey, 38% of the time people felt like there was a non-punitive response to error. And as over the years we continue to drill into that, we find that the word accountability, which we are working very hard on accountability, which is what that meeting is about this morning that I talked to you about earlier, um, people feel that holding them accountable is being punitive. So I don't know, and I'm not sure that I care, that that totally changes and gets into 90%. But what was important was for us to understand what do people mean when they say we're being punitive? And it's really about accountability. So if there's any big lesson that I've learned in the safety culture <laughs> journey, it says as you travel forward with it, you have to explain some of these things about you know, accountability and that people are going to respond by saying, you're being punitive because it's a different time, it's a different environment, and it's going to be um, a very different culture. So our composite score wasn't great, 62%, not much different than the regional and the national average. But boy, if your kid came home with a score of 62 and something, you would think, oh my gosh, what do I need to do to help? How can I support you know, my child in doing something a lot better, right? Because we all want better than that. So our CEO and our executive team and our board looked at that and went, oh my goodness, this is horrific. How can we not do something about these scores? The other thing we had been doing at Mainline Health, it was in its infancy, but nevertheless, we had a couple of years experience with crucial conversations in giving people tools to be able to learn how to converse about safety, especially when the risks are high, when emotion is high, and when you're dealing with other professionals, which is very hard to, um, to deal with. But after a couple of years of um, coursework with our management, you know, they still had really bad scores. They got a little bit better 
in some cases, especially demonstrating incompetence between 08 and 09, people were much more willing to speak up. But how frightening is it when, at best, by 2009, 38% of our managers said that they would speak up when someone made a mistake? So talk about the business case for needing to go on a cultural transformation journey. A lot of this information certainly gave us that. So these are some of our um, our uh, assessment uh, conclusions that we got from HPI. We got some good information about the support that we felt the medical staff would provide, and they got that uh, information through focus groups. We felt that there was the leadership foundation there, uh, the desire, but there, was no, there were no real tools um, in order to follow, or no roadmap, if you will, to get on this journey. So the, the safety behaviors needed to focus on questioning attitude and criti critical thinking through effective handoffs. Remember that horrible score of, you know, 38%. Um, clear team communication, intelligent compliance to behavioral expectations and rules that keep our patients safe, and communication in the presence of an authority gradient. Because I'll explain that in a minute, it's kind of common sense, you can almost guess what that means, but that we really needed to be able to empower staff. Peer checking and peer coaching, and self-checking before routine acts because many of the cases we dove into showed that lack of attention to detail was the reason for uh, the human error. So I'm going to jump here to uh, one little page of our AHRQ, AHRQ uh, patient safety survey, which explains really a little bit about the, the term power distance and authority gradient. So the question up here, staff will speak freely, speak up freely about things that may negatively affect patient care. Wow, you know, we had um, only around 75% of our staff who would do that most of the time or always. I'm gonna jump here. Staff feel free to question the decisions of those with more authority. Only a quarter of our staff said that they would, um, or a quarter of our staff, almost 50% if you say never or rarely or sometimes, about half of our staff would never speak up to someone in more authority. So that's that power distance and authority gradient or the food chain. The higher up somebody is in the food chain, the more frightening it is to actually speak up. So leveling that power distance is what our work was about. But this is what really changed, and I won't have you go through the whole thing. The most important aspect of our engagement strategy was to personalize harm. We started our kickoff meeting after our diagnostic with the lights out, the room quiet, and the CEO stood there and just watched as every name went up with the date and whether we harmed them or whether they died under our watch due to a patient safety event. Many of these people's stories um, were not told back then. Today, every patient that is harmed, everyone knows their story. And so this was really um, probably the most um, engaging, the most powerful, and the most profound reason for getting into safety culture work is because we started to understand that people's loved ones on our watch were, were continuing to be harmed. So we set a goal, um, we took it to our board, we said, you know, um, we need to have zero harm in our health system. We need to have all harm go away. But it's a journey and we have to start somewhere and we'd like to start with preventable harm. HPI has a definition of preventable harm that says that it's harm that results from a deviation in generally accepted practice standards. So this is not taking into account the patient's host factors, all of the risk factors the patient brings, many of the reasons that we explain away harm. This is about the stuff that we do or that we choose not to do that directly resulted in the harm of a patient. We said we'd like to set a target that um, after about a year after our safety training is completed, we'd like to see a 50% reduction in the number of people that have been harmed as a result of our behaviors. We in Pennsylvania, we have very strict reporting laws. I'll get into a, our all harm report. I won't show you the whole report, but it's very important to know that we don't just talk about preventable harm, we talk about all harm, we talk about near misses and 
precursor events, the kind of risk that leads to harm. And we really celebrate our uh, great catches. Every great catch, though, is a near miss and it's something that needs to be investigated. So the journey has evolved from just focusing on preventable harm to now uncovering and investigating every great catch as a near miss with precursor events that led to risk. So now that we recognize those precursor events, we can intervene before harm actually occurs to our patient. We have a list of definitions that you'll get to know quite well in terms of classification of the levels of harm and we also have some algorithms that we use because I only picked this one to bring because we had a lot of issues with the medical staff around known complications. And um, the medical staff felt that there, there are so risky procedures that they do every day where informed consent is necessary and patients are aware that harm of some type might be associated with a particular risky procedure. That doesn't mean that the patient expects that they will be harmed. That means that the patient is knowledgeable that there's risk to the procedure. But important to know is that you know we have to call everything to the um, patient safety reporting system in Pennsylvania, any type of harm, even if it's a known complication. But we have an algorithm that we would go through to determine if it was a near miss safety event, which requires full investigation, was it a precursor safety event, which requires full investigation, or was it actually a preventable serious safety event, which our safety event rate is based on this bottom number here. We know that that's not all of our harm. It's the harm we were focused on initially to try and embed our um, different safety behaviors. So we walk through these and um, we ask questions with each event. There's, I'm not gonna read this stuff, it's in your packet. There's a Friday call across our health system, our CMO, our medical director for safety and quality, who's a surgeon, is on the call. We invite the chairs of the department and we invite the, if it's a physician involved, the nurse manager, if it's a nurse involved, we invite to the calls. All of the patient safety specialists, the system director, is on the call every Friday to discuss any event that might have happened during the week and to agree on the classification of the events and to discuss how the cause analysis will occur. Because we want across the system, since it's tough to get five hospitals playing in the same sandbox sometimes, and in the beginning everybody was pointing down the road and saying, well, they're not reporting everything we're reporting. That's why our event rates are higher. We report everything. We're certain that they don't. So these Friday calls include everybody discussing each other's events so that the uh, classification will remain somewhat standardized. So early in our work, <coughs> we began seeing, as we expected, when we did training and we raised awareness, we saw that the serious safety event rate or our preventable harm events went up. And I think it's because people started to feel more comfortable reporting events of harm uh, than they were before. We used to have dots here. So HPI will show you the graphics where each dot is represents uh, the previous 12 months. So when you're looking at a rate for April of 2010, it goes from April of 2010 back through March of 2009, and that's what that particular month's rate, it, it's a 12-month cumulative um, average. So we saw our rates go up, and uh, you can see here that our training uh, with the, um, we were doing also team steps, perinatal safety training with our um, OB team that we had already um, agreed to do. But our error prevention training for staff and physicians wasn't completed until February of 2012. And at that point, we began to, you know, really understand that we've got the tools that we need and the embedding work of getting the sustainment of this culture is really where um, it's going to happen. So the, the, the dark uh, maroon uh, are, are deaths from um, preventable harm and the um, blues and the, the light blues are different uh, categorizations. So we think that um, representing these as people rather than dots uh, in meetings we tell a safety we tell the story of exactly what happened using an SBAR format. But I just wanted to show you um, 
you know, some of the tools and strategies we use. So um, working with HPI, one of the things they drilled in our heads about reliability was that this work is intentional. It cannot happen by accident. There needs to be tremendous commitment on the part of leadership because just like, um, you know, accidents don't happen without causes behind them. Uh, a new uh, culture of safety is not going to happen without some very serious tools and commitment to um, using them. So this is in your packet. Uh, the only thing I'll say about this is that the transformational roadmap is really important to follow. And what HPI brought to us, I think, was a framework. It was a framework to follow, a roadmap, some organization, some facilitation, and, and an exchange, if you will, a knowledge exchange, uh, and the ability to share with us their experience of working with hundreds and hundreds of hospitals and health systems across the country. The beginning work is prep. The diagnostic is extremely helpful in terms of making the case personal uh, to people about your patients. The core interventions are around selecting and designing, educating about, and then embedding your design for leadership methods that will lead an organization to become a high reliability organization, and then the safety behaviors uh, that will create reliability by using them every day, and that's what we call our error prevention tools. The deep dive with the patient safety specialists, there are risk managers are called patient safety specialists, so they, they wear dual hats. Our claims department is very strong. Our legal department is part of, of this uh, cultural effort, but our patient safety specialists sort of wear um, dual hats, but their title is patient safety um, versus risk management. So deep dive into cause analysis, really training them how to do cause analysis differently, understanding um, you know, how to get down into uh, more behavioral uh, uh, factors. And then the next generation interventions is where we are right now. So focus and simplify, for example. Uh, the comment I made earlier about we're very good in healthcare about designing 40-page policies. So how is a frontline nurse supposed to know what in that policy is pertinent to the role that I play, and how will I know how to do it every day? So it's not about creating checklists around everything, because if you create too many checklists, it becomes noise like everything else. But how do we actually simplify um, the ability for people to do the right thing every time through policies, through our lean performance improvement team? So that's the work that uh, we're involved with right now. So um, where are we in healthcare? We're about 10 to the third. Uh, so that you know, one in a thousand interactions in healthcare uh, could result in some type of harm event. But uh, the nuclear industry is at 10 to the eighth, so one in what is it, 100 million? Um, the aviation industry is at 10 to the seventh. And how do they do things differently than we do? We focus on good process design more and more. I think more organizations through performance improvement and, and quality teams are understanding how to implement evidence-based practices. But the interface or the integration with behavioral accountability is what your culture of safety journey will really emphasize and what it will be about. And this is the hard work, right? So um, taking the, the research and translating it into a checklist or a new protocol, standard order, order sets that IT can help us do pretty easily, um, that work is easy compared to addressing the behavior of humans. So that is why other organizations are high, re high reliability. And what healthcare has not done a very good job at, until recently, organizations like ours are making the kind of commitments that we're making. Um, we, we improve healthcare in silos, our hand hygiene team, our surgical site infections, the rapid response teams. But underlying all of this work is our culture. And a hierarchical culture even worse, a pathologic culture where people are petrified to speak up about the things that they fear, the concerns that they have. This can undermine absolutely every team, every evidence-based protocol, everything that we're trying to do. So the strategies for creating reliability are just, are, they're so simple. And now we use them. You hear them in every meeting. You hear people talk about them in terms of readmissions, in terms of our sepsis um, protocol and reducing mortality. People will say, well, remember, 
we haven't set the expectations for the ICU docs to react this way. And we haven't given them the tools that they need. So it's really fun for me to watch the language around how you transform a culture is about these three things, setting expectations, behavioral-based expectations for event-free performance, giving people the education tools and training they need, helping them practice the skills that they need so that this becomes the new behaviors become habit, and auditing enough to make sure that the new behaviors become habit, and then reinforcing and building accountability um, by making sure that everything in the organization, from our hiring practices to our performance management practices, our job descriptions, everything reflects that safety behaviors are the most important thing that we bring to Mainline Health, to MedStar, to organizations that are on this uh, cultural journey. So um, I don't want to run out of time, so a lot of this stuff I'll, I'll sort of leave into your packet because I want to show you some of the ways that we, the things and the tools that we do um, that I think make a big difference in our training. But you can see that this is really about leadership first. It's about leadership making the commitment and understanding exactly what type of transformation that we're asking them for. So you've seen tables like this a lot. So instead of safety becoming a, a priority, it becomes the core value that cannot be compromised. That um, instead of the board and senior leaders and our medical staff supporting culture change, they are actually owning it, they are leading it, they are promoting it in what they do every day. So let me talk a minute about what I think is the number one barrier to having a, a culture of reliability. And I believe it's what is referred to um, by uh, Wyke and Sut Sutcliffe as a power distance and authority gradient. So this to me, in simple translation, is about the hierarchy or the food chain in healthcare, which is very, very alive and well. Power distance is the extent to which the less powerful expect and accept that power is distributed unequally. That power distance is a measure of interpersonal power or influence superior to subordinate as perceived by the subordinate. And that the authority gradient is the perception of power and authority as perceived by the, sub the subordinate. So a very quick and interesting story. When I was at our MEC presenting our diagnostic and the early work that would be involved in the training of the medical staff, I was talking about this. And one of the surgeons who's on the MEC said, he raises his hand and he says, Denise, for crying out loud, could you just speak English? I'm so tired of your patient safety jargon. What in the heck is power distance? He said, there is no power distance. So he asked what it is. He said he didn't understand what I was talking about. <laughs> then he proceeded to say, there is no power distance in my operating room. My team will talk to me about anything. So I'm A, the only woman in the room. And B, I've got, you don't see my badge, but my name badge, you know, we're a magnet organization, we have to wear our RN badges under this. I'm the only nurse in the room. So one of the VPMAs who's sitting at the other end of the table raises his hand, he says this man's name, and he says, I think what's happening here is a demonstration, he said, with all due respect, I think this is a demonstration of exactly what Denise is talking about. He said, she's trying to explain, and she's got the definition on a slide, but he said, you're taking her on with a loud voice in front of everyone, he said, and he said, you say that in your OR, there is no power distance, the teamwork is perfect. He said, but what she's trying to say is, this gets defined by your subordinates, the people that basically are under your command, if you will. So it was a very interesting, it was perfect. I mean, nobody planned it, but it was just great. Um, as the president of the medical staff two years later, he is the one that mandated um, the, the training for all of our physicians. He mandated influenza vaccine for all of our physicians and has become one of our most fabulous uh, patient safety champions. So just wanted to hand, hand you that story. One of the things that HPI does not do that you're going to have to do. And I would be so happy to walk you, do a real drill down on what this is about, is the infrastructure that has to be built in order to take this cultural transformation 
from point A to whatever point you're going with, which will take many, many years. It really takes an incredible amount of infrastructure. Um, HPI comes in and out, they bring materials, and then they leave, and you're sitting there saying, how in the world am I going to get, you know, 10,000 people through all of this. So the culture, the, the infrastructure that is needed for culture change is enormous. It's beginning with the senior leadership team and physician leadership teams, and then the culture of safety leadership team, we developed a system-wide, a system culture of safety leadership team, and each of our campuses had a culture of safety leadership team, and I'd be glad to get into that a little bit later. But as we continue with the journey, the campus culture of safety leadership teams start picking up the ball after training is over when you're really talking about embedding culture. Culture is very local. And it's different from unit to unit, let alone hospital to hospital. So it's very important that that transformation happens from the system leading this to the hospitals leading this. And then it's more important that the staff at the front line begin to lead, to lead this. And this is where your safety coaches come in. So across Mainline Health, we have about 230 frontline safety coaches that do a phenomenal job every day making sure that our error prevention tools um, really are being embe embedded. So we had design sessions um, in a really big auditorium with audience response systems so that HPI could describe different types of safety culture um, behaviors, different types of tools that are used all across the country, and we got to vote on which ones we wanted. And then after we created the ones we wanted, we tweaked them even further to really match the kind of language we use and the kind of culture we have at Mainline Health. We developed and revised the curriculum with HPI. They bring an incredible foundational curriculum for safety. We, I will show you uh, the man, he's one of our movie stars, who actually um, decided that to approach our medical staff, we're probably going to need something a little more innovative and a little more interactive than just PowerPoint presentations. So what you guys do so well, of course, is creating videos, having role plays, and making education really interactive. We selected and trained about 150 trainers. So again, the resources on your side of this are just incredible. And we spent 12 months training our senior um, and medical staff leaders, the board, uh, all of our directors and managers, and then we got into the frontline staff and the frontline physicians. In order to approach this in an organized way and not totally go crazy, we decided to take 12 months to do it. We negotiated a lot with HPI. Their timeline was a lot shorter than ours. But we wanted to make sure that we got everyone, and we had to break them into groups. So phase one training was in the classroom training, and now annual CBT for these people, and we change the CBT every year. These are people, uh, clinical people with direct and indirect patient care. So these are not just doctors and nurses. These are your technicians, your therapists. These are everyone that are touching patients directly. And indirectly. So the nutritionist that comes into the room to work with a patient might not be providing patient care, but they're interacting in our patient rooms with our patients. The cafeteria folks are in a different phase where they would be out here, staff with limited to no patient contact, physicians who are members of the medical staff, but they're rarely on site. Now, phase two were people that were non-clinical with indirect contact. They had departmental training in brief blocks. When you think about educating environmental services and facilities and people who, many of our people, English was not their first language. So that needed a very different type of training that was really customized toward how, how those groups of people learn. We also mixed some of them in when we did the full staff training, but we made sure that we had very focused departmental training, that the SBARs and case studies that we used were scenarios that they would be ver uh, really familiar, familiar with and connect with. So um, I'm not going to get into these facts about human error. Uh, but here is our reliability toolkit and what we selected as our leader methods. There were only three. To make safety a core value, to find and fix system problems, and to build accountability. But the tools, the commitments that our leaders had to make were much different. Starting every meeting with a safety story, uh, recognizing and supporting the courageous people who are stepping up and stopping the line, our daily check-ins, 
brief execute and debrief, um, rounding to influence. Those are the kinds of behaviors that leaders have to demonstrate today in order to change the culture. I'm going to talk a minute about finding and fixing problems. So um, on an aircraft carrier, walking the deck silently, looking everywhere, everyone sweeping the deck to see, is there a paper clip? Is there anything that could end up in a propeller or an engine that could result in harm? This is not something we do very well in healthcare. If you've ever done rounding in an ICU without talking but just observed, you see some of the most horrifying things because it's a really high stress, high movement um, type of area. So um, there is a safety huddle followed by a walk around. It's at 9.30 every day in every hospital across our health system. Started out with just leadership and executive safety huddle and then moved into department level and unit level safety huddles. They are not at 9.30. They are built in at the time of day that is best for patient care. So that 9.30 is not going to work on a busy nursing unit. So they do it at, at different times, but they all do it, and they do it every day, and we do it on Saturdays and Sundays as well. So uh, there's a typical agenda for the safety huddle. Um, we started out with the number of days uh, since our last preventable harm events in January of 2013. We started talking about all harm. So now we have an all harm report that goes beyond just our preventable harm but gets into every type, no matter how minor or any type of near, near miss, is discussed at the daily safety huddle. The follow-up reports from action items that were identified the day before. Um, we start the clock if there is an activity that needs immediate response. Uh, a person is identified in the room that will be responsible for starting the clock and having the action taken care of in as, in as few hours as possible. And then there's a communication team that works to report that out into the organization if that's needed. And then by the next morning, that problem needs to be um, resolved. Great catches and uh, great experience stories are shared at these meetings. And the employee and physician um, safety concerns are discussed also. Uh, our mainline error prevention toolkit, we have five safety behavioral expectations. And you can see here it says, I commit to the following. So each of our staff, when they go through training, they take the commitment, they sign a commitment document that says, I commit to these safety behaviors. It's attention to detail, communicate clearly, hand off effectively, speak up for safety, and got your back. I commit to those safety behaviors by practicing the following error prevention tools. Stop, think, act, and review, which is STAR, the three-way repeat back and readbacks, using SBAR to hand off. We use SBAR for everything, not just patient stories. Um, somebody will call me, and as they start rambling, I'll say, could you SBAR that for me? So almost all of the discussions that need to be concise and impactful are done in an SBAR type of form format. Using ARC to escalate safety concerns, peer checking and peer coaching. So all of these, if you think back to how errors occur, they're knowledge-based, they're skill-based, and they're rule-based. So these error prevention tools are aimed directly at the prevention of knowledge-based, skill-based, and, and rule-based errors. I'd like to show you an example of the use of ARC, and you're going to see something else that I talked about. I'm going to ask you what it is after I show this video, quick video to you. An error prevention tool to help with the safety behavior of speaking up for safety is a mnemonic called ARCC, A-R-C-C. A is to ask a question. R is to make a request should your question not be heard. The first C is to voice a concern and the second C is to use the chain of command should you need to do so. Dr. Jones, do you have any um, instruments up there on the field? Nope. Uh, I sent everything back there. I just got my uh, needle driver and my forceps, and uh, we're going to be finished up here in about five minutes. You know what? I'm missing a hemostat. Well, it's not up here. Look on the floor. I've already looked, and there's nothing on the floor. Well, it's not in the abdomen, and how the hell could you be missing a hemostat? Dr. Jones, do you mind just looking again for the hemostat? It might have just gotten caught under something. Maybe you used it to attach the cautery. Look, 
I got my hand in the abdomen here. There is no way we left a hemostat in the abdomen. We'll need to take an x-ray. An x-ray? Great. Go ahead. Delay me another hour here. Dr. Jones, I'm concerned that the count is off. It's possible that the previous count was off, but they told me there are eight hemostats and I can only find seven hemostats. We're going to need to take an x-ray. If, if you won't follow through with this, I'll have to call Supervisor Ratchet. Oh, all right. For Pete's sake, go ahead and get the slowest molasses x-ray tech up here and get on with it, please. And would somebody call for my next patient? And can I have that skin stapler, please? So knowing your culture, it will be important that you have design sessions where you have people actually select the tools that you'll be using. Safety Culture 102 is about embedding and reducing the power gradient by sending physicians out to the units after they go through the 101 uh, training, that they go out to their units in their departments and they have a library of SBARs. And the SBARs are scenarios that have actually occurred in the outpatient setting, in the um, laboratory, in radiology, in the operating room, the ICU, the units, every kind of setting. So they pick tools from this library and they sit and have an informal discussion with the team. Uh, Barry Mann says, you bring donuts or pizza? I said, Barry, please, like bring fruit or something, but don't bring <laughs> donuts or pizza. But the idea is to promote the physician as the leader of the culture change and also to show the staff that if their physicians are willing to sit and talk to them about scenarios that might not have happened on their unit but could and what error prevention tools will we use as a team to prevent that, it's really incredible incredibly powerful in terms of embedding the culture of safety. I have a video on it and I'll make sure you have it so that we don't use more time on it. But the um, education has been extremely interactive. We have a role play uh, that's called a day in the OR that's part of um, the training that we do for medical staff. So um, in summary, we've trained um, over 7,000 people with in-classroom kind of what we call hands-on and very interactive training. Um, we have over 200 physicians who have stepped up to the plate to say, and our goal is to have 500 by the end of this year, that are going out onto the units and doing the Safety Culture 102. And there's an example in here that I'll make sure I leave with Dave of how the physicians are actually doing Safety Culture 102 on their units. So um, all I'll say about this is that staff pay attention to what leaders pay attention to, right? So unless the leaders take this commitment seriously, the staff will never take it seriously. So the leaders walking the walk has been, and sustaining that, has been some of our hardest work just because of competing priorities. We have monthly great catches that um, are celebrated at every organization. At the end of the year, we have the best catch of the year. People get big gold glove trophies. They get a golden glove pin to wear on their badge. And if they get a best catch of the year, they also get a check. Um, these are our patient safety success stories. Every one of these stories are near misses that become um, investigated. These people receive certificates, and often the uh, great catches come from our patient safety success stories. We have a whole library of them that um, the system can access on our website. What's most important is that we identify what error prevention tool has been used in the safety success stories so that we can prove to people that these particular tools are the things that are actually, their behavior changes in using these <coughs> tools are what is preventing harm. We have our first red rule up and running across the system. It's around two patient identifiers. Our second red rule is under development right now with procedural teams and it is a mandatory um, briefing and debriefing at the end of um, every type of procedure. Um, we do use uh, Just Culture with our HR. We use a guide towards uh, of, uh, assessing unsafe acts. And um, you'll see here that we use this with managers and HR to try and understand the difference in where there's a system or an individual problem, where something needs to have remediation and a lot of support versus some real uh, type of correct corrective action. So in our journey, 
We're into, we've checked off all of these boxes. We're into uh, integration with our hiring processes um, and our integration with our performance review process. So we're building in language for all of the leaders around their personal use of the uh, methods for reliability and uh, the staff with uh, error prevention tools. And um, integrating with all of our PI teams. Uh, how do we build in high reliability as we're changing process design? This is our all patient safety event uh, report. I brought you the summary, which is so busy, but I, it's just meant to tell you that we track every type of harm, even um, events that didn't result in harm to a patient but could have. Uh, we label what has been a sentinel event, a preventable harm event, <coughs> and uh, we make sure that we understand that not just preventable harm is going down, but that in the past couple of years, all of our types of events of harm have gone down. And we have um, reached our goal of we've gotten a 78% reduction in preventable harm through uh, this cultural journey. So I'm happy to, I'll be around, I'll answer any questions later so that we can get to the uh, discussions at the table. And thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Let's take a couple minutes for questions if people are okay. and stuff. Okay, so while Dave's getting um, set up, he said we have a few minutes. Yeah, we've got a couple have... minutes if there's specific questions people want to catch Denise with right now. Yes. I have more of a comment. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for that excellent, excellent presentation, as always, from you. Thank you. Um, I came from a different organization where a mistake was made with a child, and um, it was the result of a motor vehicle accident where the child's mother had died. When the child was recovering in our hospital, um, and a mistake was made by a routine practice, or, or what they thought was routine practice, and um, an adult dose of dilantin was given to the child, and then it resulted in the child's death. The father of that child spoke to our um, organization about a year later after that, and one thing that he said, and this was about 10 years ago, but one thing that he said that always stuck with me is that he he wasn't angry with us. But he wanted us to realize during, during his son's hospitalization, he watched care providers come and go. And he said, they, I think you made the statement earlier about automatic practice, automatic yeah. things that we do without thinking. And he said that no matter how simple the practice is, or how simple the act is we're doing, that the only thing that he wanted care providers to always remember is that every single act that they do during any given shift impacts the patient and their family in some way no matter how small. So I think that part of our culture of safety is that we have to remember that there is nothing that is very simple anymore. And That's that right. we always have to be cognizant of every single thing that we do. And that means being cognizant of our environment around us and every little um, practice that we do, no matter how simple or complex we might think it would be. Absolutely right. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for that comment. And it's so true. And the reason for peer checking and peer coaching is because in um, a complex environment, which healthcare, nothing, I don't know how, what could be more complex than healthcare, uh, but I think that um, the concept of peer checking and peer coaching, in order to surround you with people that will help you um, in your everyday simple acts, catch something that you just won't see because you're on automatic pilot. That, in addition to the power distance and authority gradient, tackling peer checking and peer coaching has been one of our biggest struggles. And you can understand why. You know, and, and nurses will tell us, I'm more comfortable speaking up to Dr. Mann, who, who was our Dr. Jones in the movie. I'm more comfortable speaking up to him or stopping the line with physicians during a procedure than I am talking to Susie about going into an isolation room and never using any garb because I've worked with her for 20 years. Our kids are in school together. They do gymnastics together. So peer ch checking and peer coaching is truly one of the hardest aspects, I think, of this work. And it's because of what you said. We get into automatic pilot. The simple things we do every day, it's nothing to you know, to sort of make a, a, a slip. And to have people around you that are watching you and counting on you to watch them is really one of the uh, tools that are aimed at um, just this kind of scenario that you pointed out. Thank you. Yeah. Get time for one more before we get into any other questions. We have one over here. Yeah. <clears throat> 
It's my power gradient girl. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask a question about um, if your healthcare system extended this in the outpatient setting. Because the outpatient setting is Thank you. Of a stepchild we <laughs> we sure did include the outpatient setting. So we um, have a behavioral health and um, alcohol and drug treatment center. They were involved, and our physician office practices. We started. We made a separate group of concentric circles for outpatient, mm -hmm. starting with mainline healthcare because they're our employees, right? So we could impact them a little better. And then next was our volunteer medical staff who are not members of mainline healthcare. And here's how we did it. We got a team of um, business managers, office nurses, and real patient safety champions, including many of our primary care doc um, practices, even specialty physicians who were in the outpatient setting. We pulled them together. We had a dinner meeting with them. We went through what the culture change and the training was about. And a lot of them in big assemblies were hearing it. But we really focused on them. We said, we need you to help us lead this by creating SBARs or scenarios that are typical and common in the outpatient setting. We need you to identify and we will help train trainers in the outpatient setting. And we need you to tell us how can training occur best in the outpatient setting. So yes, we all of our outpatient practices, man, mainline health care practices were mandatory mm -hmm. and then strongly recommended for our, our non-mainline health care practices. We had about 70% compliance from our non-mandated health care practices. Mm -hmm. and it's because they took it on. They're business managers, they're office nurses. They created wonderful scenarios, which are part of our SBAR library. So thank you for asking that. Yeah, yeah that's good. So you see, it, it's very exciting work. Oh, thanks. It's uh, very exciting work, and it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of commitment. You heard her talk about building curricula, and, and you saw teams literally going through simulation trainings of events and how they would handle it differently than maybe they have in the past. Yet you see the results. These results are consistent across many of the hospitals and systems across the country that have begun this journey. And, and you saw a lot of stuff that you've already been doing here at MedStar. You've been doing for a couple years now. So we're hoping that a lot of this will just reinforce and build on some of the great work being done. Now I want you to take the next 15 minutes at your table, and I want you to take the question that's in there. You heard Denise talk about a lot of different tactics, educational uh, interventions, tools, and even recommendations, she said. At your table, I want you to think of what were the two tactics or educational um, vehicles that were brought up that you think would be most important for us as we launch high reliability and we begin our journey those types of things that really resonated with you that said this is going to be really critical in our entity in our environment across MedStar and then after 15 minutes we're going to ask you to share um, one or two of those tools and tactics and, and educational modules that you thought would be most critical okay thanks MedStar National we had a hospital. So we looked at some of the tools and, and somebody made the point, McDonald's gets it 100% right with read back verify. You don't get the wrong order because they read it back to you. Right. Why can McDonald's get it right and, and not healthcare? Uh, and I think just to sneak in that third yeah. one, how important it is, staff learn from leadership. If leadership is rounding and asking the questions and telling the stories, then staff are gonna be more comfortable speaking up, et cetera. So those were our three takeaways. Great. Thanks. Good stuff. Um, I like those three. Uh, someone else? Anybody else? Okay, so we have three. Um, senior leadership and physician dedication. They, they must be the leaders, not the quality department. Mm -hmm. It has to be your physician and senior leadership. Um, personalization of safety events. Mm -hmm. That again, and we think a lot of these safety events should not be the nurse safety events, but starting with physicians talking about their safety events. And then accountability has to be dealt in the same manner for staff as for physicians. Loved your example of high volume physicians, well known, respected. We have to be able to stand up. We have staff that are often um, 
publicly you know they've lost their job or they've been reprimanded, mm -hmm. but the physicians, you never hear about what has happened, and they walk in the next day and do their procedures. Yeah. For our table, we came up with um, communication using the SPAR. We found out that it's um, important to use that because when you're trying to communicate the safety issue, you should have a background, and it helps you, especially even when you're contacting a doctor, to give them the whole background of everything. And also, we talked about um, tracking an event using the analysis, which is the near miss and the investigation. And I believe that's what anything else we came about. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Good stuff. Good. We talked about um, building on the non-punitive event, that that's the non-punitive culture, that that's very important. And then finally, we talked about leadership as a, and safety as a core measure, because you can teach these skills and nothing changes. You, you've taught them, and that's fine, and everybody goes back and does their own thing, but leaders have to be involved, and they have to be present, and they have to be speaking it and reinforcing it every day. And eventually, it'll get to the part where it's owned by the staff, and you can have leaders leave, and new leaders come on, and it'll still be owned. But if it's not led and reinforced each and every day in the beginning, it'll be lost. Yeah, great comment. And Pam, while well, like you've got the microphone, would you like to share just a minute? You were the first MedStar Franklin Square, was the first to go through the diagnostics. And um, I'd just be curious to share, you know, like 60 seconds of thoughts about the process and, and what it I, to you. I thought it was wonderfully helpful. We um, opened up the diagnostic, the discussions to a number of our staff. So when we talked about falls, we had our falls team actually come in and go through the falls RCAs and review with Scott. We had Scott Knapp there. He was wonderful. Um, and so we had our staff learning about how the different scoring systems and, and discussing that. And, and that all helps to learn. And, helps them to learn and gets them ready for it. So we had, um, we had about 30 or 40, 40 physicians. We had um, quite a few staff and leaders come for those leadership sessions. So there were interviews for the leaders, there were interviews for staff, and interviews for physicians. And then we sat down and we went through every RCA for the last two, two years and reviewed them for a level of seriousness and the causative factors um, it was a, a, a tremendous learning opportunity for us. I would say as many people, those of you who haven't done it yet, as many people as you can involve, bring, bring everybody into the room and have them discuss those scenarios. That alone is, is beginning of learning and people, it really piqued everybody's interest and they really want to know more about it now. So we're just raring to go. It was great. No, that's great, and I think Helen, you, Georgetown went through it too, is that correct? Yeah, we went through it just a couple of weeks ago, and everybody's sort of wanting to know what that report comes out. It was, it was very interesting, because I think even with the, sorry, I think even with the tables in front of us and all the diagrams, it was interesting to see the subjectivity there was, there was to how one would assign some of these events. Yeah. And that was interesting to talk about at that, and I think people were pretty articulate about why they would put it somewhere else. And so I think you do have to realize even with these tools, there's going to be some subjectivity at the bottom mm -hmm. line, no matter what, mm -hmm. and just accept yeah. that. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's good. And it is, like Denise said, it, you really, I'm curious to see the reports also because it, it does open your eyes up to different things and, and what it did for, you know, Mainline and, and their recognition. You sort of know it when you see it in a report or you see it in graphs and stuff. It, it really gets you to think differently about it. So thanks for sharing that, on that and stuff. Who else would like, oh, back there. Yep. Gary McFadden, MedStar in Georgetown. So um, we had talked about a number of things, but um, narrowed it down to two base that we thought were very important. The first one was that is that we spend a lot of time educating each other. Um, and it seems to reach the leadership group, but we don't think that it really infiltrates down to the frontline staff as often as we would like it to, um, or as it, as it needs to be, as it should be required to be. So it's knowing that it's very difficult to get people away from their, the patients, which, where they're supposed to be for, you know, any more than five minutes. Um, it's difficult to get people to an in-service for an hour, two hours, four hours, does, it doesn't happen. And every unit, at least in our hospital, they have morning huddles not just the inpatient units, but a lot of the ancillary services. 
So we thought that um, making a safety moment a part of those huddles there, it, it could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes, but to pick a topic, and these huddles happen every day, but to talk about it. Um, I was at a hospital where they did um, huddles in environmental every morning, and their first five minutes was a safety topic, and it could have been lifting or a patient safety thing, anything, but it got the message across um, for that thing, and when you reiterate it time after time again, you have to keep it in the forefront so that it stays with the person and it's not lost um, amongst all of the other tiered um, pieces of information that they have to get. So we have to keep that alive. Secondly, um, we really like, Denise, we really like your STAR tool and um, we thought that that really should be part of our practice. And Dave, we are gonna do med STAR rounding. Um, <laughs> like that. I like that. But we felt that, you know, um, somebody at our table mentioned that they were in a mall and there was an overhead announcement that says all managers report to your areas for a safety check. And we should be doing that during the day, um, not necessarily making that overhead announcement, but having a time where the manager, they make a, a rounding in their department and they use the STAR tool looking for um, evidences of things that might harm the patient, that might harm the associates. Um, or any kind of an issue that might need to be paid attention to that might just otherwise be overlooked, no matter how big or small. So we thought that would be important. Yeah, great thoughts, great ideas. Yes. Zach Hettinger with the Human Factors Group and uh, also with MedStar Union Memorial. Uh, we had talked about a lot of the similar issues with uh, SBAR and ARC um, using the algorithm that was put up there in terms of identifying serious safety events and near misses. Uh, and then the use of language and the importance of supporting each other and making people feel comfortable uh, when they're talking about safety issues. Um, and then one of the two other issues that we talked about that we thought would be helpful would be uh, the use of simulation. Oops. Use of simulation and training. Um, and that that really helps ingrain some of the, the safety behaviors and training. And then lastly, one of the issues that we brought up was um, there was a, a strong focus on physicians. Um, but are there other identified uh, safety leaders that, that we can work with, whether they're nurse managers or even people that have a significant seniority um, or even technicians or whoever it is that maybe can influence change other than the physicians and that maybe working with teams um, and not necessarily just having the physicians do the training, um, but having a multidisciplinary team that does the training. Great. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll start with um, a response to the recent comment about um, multidisciplinary training teams, and that's exactly what we had. Um, I emphasized physicians because um, we were told that the physicians would be the hardest group to get on board. It was so easy to get trainers. They, they were volunteering from everywhere. And some of our best trainers were from uh, facilities, environmental services. So there were even uh, non-clinical RPI engineers all became trainers. So, but we always had a team of trainers. So we never had a nurse or um, a laboratory uh, pharmacist train without a physician. So they always uh, train together. Um, our training looked like this. We had eight hours for all of the uh, senior leaders. So that was down through the director level. I'm sorry, that was down through the manager level. So directors, managers, vice presidents, um, physician leaders were in the room. So that's chiefs, chairs, um, uh, medical directors, of ICUs, infection prevention, all of those people received um, eight hours worth of in-class training. And so negotiating that with the CEO and the CFO, you know, that really spoke to their leadership commitment because we know that, that we were working so hard on non-productive hours and then all of a sudden we show up and say, HPI wanted two days. We negotiated it to one day and I think did a really good job with the one day. When we got to the, um, the staff training, so below uh, manager and our frontline medical staff, the, um, it was a three and a half hour course, which now we've uh, brought it down to two hours. And so that happens with every new person that goes, comes into the organization, goes in an in-class room where we have videos, interaction, role play, and everybody goes through two hours of training if they have direct or indirect patient care. The CBTs are phenomenal because they're very interactive too and they have videos embedded into them so we've made them rather interesting. The question of um, 
on the, from the outset, uh, what would have been the effectiveness of doing more online training? Mm -hmm. I think that it would have been more agreeable, the, uh, yeah. especially uh, for the medical staff, but everyone, to have done uh, more online training. But once we got them into the room, and we did it early in the morning, and we did it at dinner time, and we'd have rooms like this with tables like this, and you know the, the dummy OR table with a patient on it, which was really pillows covered up. Um, and we'd have some role plays and stuff in the front of the room. So we did that in the morning and at night. Once they got in the room, and the feedback that we got was it would they would have appreciated doing it online until they got into the room because they think that the message was delivered differently and forcing them to speak up and explain why they voted for this tool versus that tool in a particular SBAR scenario that we used. And they said you could have never gotten that online, so we appreciate having to have gone through it once. Now they do, their repeat training will of course be online. It'll yeah. all be through CBT. Certification and, and stuff. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I don't know the answer. We talked to other health mm -hmm. systems that did um, more like 70% online yeah. and 30% in the classroom for key mm -hmm. um, patient care leaders, but somebody made a great point. Um, it's been made by several people in the room actually that the staff need to start owning this. So, I don't know about you, but I just finished my CBTs, my required CBTs for the year. So I sat in front of the television, I had my computer in my lap, and um, I was just kind of clicking through the CBTs. And so I know that, um, and, and I'm pretty committed to this, so yeah. <laughs> I, I just think that, you know, to really consider um, what groups you'll need to have in the, in the classroom. and. So we identified probably uh, about 500 to 700 physicians who we felt have enough direct influence through patient care um, that we needed them in the classroom one time. And then after that, and, and what emerged from that too was the patient safety champions that we could see in the room. And then we started like making notes and taking their names and using them for the embedding teams and to, to start to take some of it forward. Yes. Table seven's last. Uh, I'm Vaughn Parker, and I'm, I'm from Union Memorial Hospital. And I think that each table that we went around to has pretty much echoed the same thing, but our table pretty much said that the leadership has to lead the way and be present from the start and going forward, not just to say we are starting an initiative and, and, and then you don't see the leaders anymore. And I've seen that at our hospital where our senior leaders have been engaged from start to finish and the outcomes uh, I mean, pretty much they've showed around the network. So I think having the leadership involved from start and, and kind of not just pushing from the rear, kind of leading from the front makes a big difference. Uh, I think the biggest thing for us has been hand, hand hygiene throughout our network. As it's been the biggest challenge to get physicians to you know, wash their hands when they go in a room and come out. And I think that once our physicians start doing it, our numbers change. And you could see it from a person who collects it every month. So I think it's important that the leaders not just, you know, lay out these strategies and say this is what we're going to do, but follow through, to, follow through with it from start to finish. Yeah, that's great. I do. I do want to comment on that because it's come from probably four uh, tables at this point, this comment. Um, so I'll share a very quick story. Our CEO, about a year into this journey, who was right beside me, right behind me, hand on my back all the time, said, um, I have to disclose something to you. He said, I've been a CEO for a long time and I have always been committed to patient safety. But he said, I've always felt that it was people like you who needed to lead, you know, lead it. And your passion is contagious, of course, but he said, what you made me do was really squirm. When you uh, showed stories, um, had uh, clinicians tell tear tearful stories of things that happened on our watch, it, when it started to dawn on me that I, as a leader of this organization, was fully responsible for what happened to patients on our watch. He said, I started to question my own commitment because I talked the talk, but I wasn't walking the walk until I got uncomfortable enough to have to do it. So I said to him, so what are you gonna do differently? 
He said, well, um, I'm going to start doing some of the things I've been asking you to do. He said, I'm going to start asking hospital presidents to do some of the things that the campus culture of safety teams are doing. And he said, I'm going to start holding the presidents accountable at our meetings for telling me stories of how they're um, embedding the culture. So I share that with you because at one point I realized that everybody was there at the kickoff and, and all the leaders were very much in front. And then all of a sudden, as the culture safety leadership teams at each campus started becoming more active, the presidents were disappearing. You know, the, the chairs of the medical staff and the hospital, um, um, the president of the hospital medical staffs were, were disappearing. So I took an article, there's a good article on Harvard Business Review about why cultural, trend, uh, organizational culture change fails. And it speaks to that, that the leaders are there at the beginning, but because of competing priorities, they're, they're kind of off somewhere else um, later. So I guess the message of keeping the leadership very uncomfortable about the risk and continuing to personalize the stories and you know and and pointing to leaders who have said you know we have so many competing priorities finances in this environment being the biggest one but patient safety must trump every other every other thing that we do every day I think getting them to walk the walk, you'll do that in your own way. Uh, that'll maybe be different at each campus, but I can tell you that I stand here and tell a wonderful story and show great results because if we had three days, I could tell you the horror stories and the strategies we've had to use to keep re-engaging leaders. Rounding to influence, for example, I love that. Um, Med Star rounding, but rounding the influence has been the hardest uh, tool uh, for us to get embedded throughout the leadership because everybody said they would do it and then they weren't doing it or they were rounding, but they weren't rounding the influence. They were just kind of showing up. So thank you for bringing that point across all of you that have. I can tell you it's going to be one of the biggest challenges of your journey is to keep the leaders, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, and HPI is, um, they're very vocal about that. They will tell you uh, the biggest thing that happens is when they spend the two years plus with an organization and everybody feels like they've checked the box, they've done it, and they leave and there isn't really a transformation. There isn't the leaders doing what Denise said constantly and it becomes habit, it becomes culture versus did that, now others get it, so it, it'll probably continue and we're off to the next priority. And that'll be a challenge for us. That'll be uh, something that we'll have to keep our eye on the ball as we move forward. A lot of common themes. I think we covered every table, didn't we? Any other table that was left? Oh, there were two more, sorry. But, uh, our table came up with you know sharing lessons learned. Um, often that's done kind of insulated within the leadership team and with the individual person who may have made the error and maybe expanded out to that same group of clinicians to make sure that they're on the watch to make sure this doesn't happen again, but sharing it out with the entire team to say, here's a good catch that was made or here's an error that was made that we can all learn from. So that was one thing. And the big thing is um, sharing, doing the SBAR scenarios between the, with the physicians and with the associates. Um, we have some experience at our table from Hospital Center who's already engaged with, with yeah. HPI and they're kind of struggling with that. So I think that that would be very important for MedStar to make sure happens. As well as the safety huddles, a lot of us are already doing um, operational type huddles. Um, and if we could just tack on a safety moment to all of those huddles. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like there's some feedback. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. We have, you have a microphone? Yeah. The two items that we had discussed was having all levels of associates on board um, with the HBI training, especially the physicians, and having them leading the journey. Um, so when it comes to the power distance and the authority gradient, that was we talked about that a lot. Um, and again, just proper utilization of the toolkit for everyone, and then continuing to provide that feedback to associates, so not just rolling it out and saying, here we go, but showing them the changes and why we're doing what we're doing and having that conversation with them, not just the leadership, but all associates. And then we also talked about the importance of your slide that mentioned the infrastructure and alignment with the transformation, because you had mentioned that was outside of what HPI had provided. Um, so again, setting the expectations and reinforcing and building that accountability. Great. So a lot of common themes uh, and a lot of things that we've jotted down and, and we'll keep, as I said, our eye on the ball and make sure that we pay attention to this stuff as we move forward. Uh, 
Denise, any last comments you wanted to share before we took a break? I know you'll be around and, and be able to meet with people at lunch and stuff. Well, I think that you're identifying, I, I think that the, the groups are identifying <coughs> all the most important um, aspects of this. Um, I, I can't stress enough the fact that we did not know going into it mm -hmm. uh, what we were in for. And we <laughs> did not have early on, uh, the infrastructure kept evolving. And so um, Lynn asked me, um, when we were while we were changing tables and stuff, uh, she said, "Well, how how do you get the the resources to do that?" So, it's the people in the organization that are so passionate about this that they step up and say, "You know, yes, I'm willing to spend you know ten to fifteen percent of my time in my job, being a you know a trainer, mm -hmm. a member of the um, culture safety leadership team." It's um, getting the um, organizational leadership to agree to. You know, part of a lot of this is negotiating mm -hmm. about resources and roles and time commitments, because it's always about money and non-productive time and that and getting staff, you know, to training and so on. So I think um, the role of the leaders and uh, Dave, I know you'll have you know a great leadership um, team with you doing this, is to constantly be having those crucial conversations with mm -hmm. leadership about. You know, this this must be a commitment. This must be the commitment, the mm -hmm. most important commitment, because this is the thing that we um, owe to our patients. So I think you've really hit on all of the um, all of the key issues. Great, Thank you. thanks. Um, yes, Lynn. Thank you so much for coming today. This is just um, <coughs> this to me is a dream come true to have Denise come and share, because. Um, I've been in healthcare for 35 years, and I think the way that we're going to affect change is to tell those stories. So we have our HEIC meeting Monday, and I need one person to volunteer to come with this patient story, and we need to share every, at every meeting a patient story because what Denise shared with Wayne and I a few minutes ago was that we'll get the leaders uncomfortable. Once we get the leaders uncomfortable, that's when we're going to start affecting change. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Yeah, and, and uh, echo Lynn's comments. Thank you. It was a perfect talk at the perfect time, I believe, for us and, and where we're going and, and sharing what we get to look forward to. A very exciting stuff ahead, very challenging stuff, a very exciting stuff. So let's take um, 15 minutes now, about 17 minutes, I guess, and we'll get started at 10.15 for the second half. Thanks. <laughs>